without protection While only using fear and guilt and not love to motivate me Now I'm trying my hardest to undo your damage You took advantage of my obedience Gotta reclaim my power, be my sweetness sour then stole my flowers, now I'm replanting them Watch me still continue on growing 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 Continue on growing Continue on growing Continue on growing Continue on Continue on growing You said I'd be invited as a guest without a fee But never valued my heart My worth was measured by my deeds Said you'd give me my sign But your truth was blinding Justifying your behavior while manipulating me Watch me still continue on growing you said now we're sowing No longer need approval cause I know it I owned it, I loaned it, but you stole it You told me I would change, I would change. Oh, if I went astray I went away. But now I'm just away. I'm just away. And you were just a fake You told me I would you change, told me I would change. Told me I would change Oh, no, if I went astray If I went away Oh, now I'm just away Now I'm just away Hey, you were just a fake You said I'd be possessed But love is my only possession You tried to limit my perception But reality the truth always was inside me Watch me still continue on to grow Continue on to flow and show love without motives Watch me still continue on to flow Continue on to grow and show love without motives Good morning. Welcome to Playing in Traffic. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, today we have a special guest, Amani. And last episode, we played her a beautiful song that she wrote and she sang. And um, today we're going to have her on so she can tell her story with us. So you guys, I just want to give you a quick little overview about Amani's story so that um, she can come on and, um, you know, tell us all of her exciting stories. All right, so Amani, um, she was a member of the Church of God also on the like southeast side of the country. <laughs> um, she was baptized and preached to in Atlanta, Georgia, and she was preached to in October of 2008, and she studied for two months, which I thought was really interesting, and then got baptized in December. Um, she stayed in Atlanta for one year, and then after that, she moved to El Salvador with her husband and her daughter. And so she went to the church in El Salvador. She was back and forth between that church and the Atlanta church. 
And then um, after about four years, she moved to Tampa and Atlanta and was back and forth between those churches. And um, then she moved to Jacksonville in 2014 to 2016 with her family, her husband and her daughter. And um, that's when you received kind of training, right, about for the house church? Yes. Yeah. That's when and we were chosen to go to Miami. Right. And then 2016, she was sent to Miami as a gospel worker. And then in 2020, her and her daughter escaped so bravely from this high control group. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really excited to talk with Amani today because she has been to several churches and even to a different country. And um, I'm excited to hear what it was like over there. Uh, we've only really heard stories about, you know, like Colorado and um, sort of like the East Coast. I'm sorry, sort of like the West Coast. So yeah, it'll be true. exciting to hear. Yeah. yeah so true. welcome, Amani, to yes. Playing in Traffic. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, world. <laughs> so yeah. I heard you guys um, last um, episode, you were saying that there's 30 states listening and eight countries. I yeah. was so shocked because the podcast has just like recently started. Yeah. So that's amazing that we're is every time every time we check it we're like oh my gosh a new yeah. country yeah. That's... over there but right. when korea popped on we were like oh my god like we were really excited about that one really yeah, yeah. It doesn't that. have we don't have a lot of listeners in korea but we have a little bit so that's exciting yeah. wow that is interesting yeah so uh, welcome what we would just like to you know hear your story um yeah uh, where would you like to start? Uh, first of all, Amani, I want to ask you, where were you born? I was just curious when I was reading your story. So I was born in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah, cool. I was born in Atlanta, but traveled around all my life um, to Florida, um, Kentucky. I've been many places, but yeah, I was born in Atlanta. Where's your favorite place that you've ever lived? Um, Charlotte now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. So now yeah. you're in North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because it was, yeah. I actually chose to be here. It, everything that I'm doing right now is based off of my own freedom, my own choice. So everything that I do right now, I love it. That's awesome. So, I love being here in Charlotte. Um, mm. But yeah, so I just want to start because I feel like my story is centered around my family. Because that was always kind of like my struggle within the church. So I just want to start a little bit about that from the beginning. Um, so since I was a little girl, I always wanted to have a family. And when I say family, I mean like husband and a lot of kids. Like <laughs> that's always my dream because I never thought that going to school and working was, um, I, don't know, I felt it very meaningless, you know? Like ever since I was younger, I'm like so, we're just going to work and then die like that makes no sense, you know, so I always felt like my dream and the way to make my life happy is through family, through establishing a strong, you know, supportive husband and beautiful kids and just, you know, investing my time and every and energy into my family. So that was my goal. But I also had a lot of doubts about like, my spiritual status you know like i always wondered like okay so having these kids and having this husband what will really be the ultimate destination you know because I, I always question the spiritual side or who i really was or you know what was the purpose of even being born on this earth so um right after high school i um well not after but in high school, I found my husband and we, at first, I couldn't have children. Like, I know this is like not about the church, but this is important to me because I was told that I couldn't have kids. So I was mm. devastated. I'm like, Aww. oh my God. So my whole dream is just out of the window, you know, Aww. like, so now what am I going to do? So a few, like a year after that, I got pregnant with my daughter. Wow. So I was so happy. Like it was just, you know, my dream come true. But then um, so when we moved into our apartment, I still had that curiosity about, you know, spirituality. So I would invite, you know, um, I grew up Jehovah's Witness. 
So I would still have them come over and just study with me at the house. And if the Mormons would stop by, I would invite them over. And just many churches, they would always come over and they'd love stopping by my house because they knew I would invite them in and we would study. <laughs> so one day, a different, you know, religion came because I was like, are you Jehovah Witness? They were like, no. Are you Mormon? And they were like, no. So I'm like, OK. Um, so they started talking to me about Passover. I had never heard about the Passover before. And um, my husband at the time, he never wanted to study the Bible. He was always like, you know, why do you keep inviting these people? Nobody really knows. You know, this is a waste of time. But this particular case, he could hear a study from the other room. And um, I guess it piqued his interest because he came out of the room and he sat down and then we both started studying the Bible. And um, they started going into the Catholic Church and how they were the identity of Satan and all of these things. And it was just such a different experience. You know, it's such a different um, approach to the Bible and everything that I was reading. I'm like, wow, you know, God said, let us. I'd never seen that before. I've read that page a thousand times, but I never noticed it, you know. So, so many things were just brought to my attention. So that same day we went to the um, we went to the church and um, the greeting that we received was like top tier. Like I really felt like a celebrity walking through the door. And the way they treated us was so different. You know, I've never been greeted that way, not even from my own family. So I just felt like this has to be from God, you know, because the love is different and, you know, it had to be some type of, you know, special place. Mm-hmm. So um, as time went on I noticed that um like in the beginning everything was good you know we studied a lot can I ask a quick question can I can I I'm just curious do you feel like when you were preached to and you were baptized do you feel like you were in a vulnerable time of your life or maybe like um do you think that the timing that they got you was important that you accepted at that time or um or do you think you were just kind of always searching and then they just came along? Yeah, I mean, I felt like that was the vulnerability, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Me being so eager to know about God and eager to know about the spiritual world. Like, mm-hmm. I think I was so desperate that I really, you know, because I, I researched all the time. That was my mm-hmm. I woke up in the morning and I would just read online about like spirituality and yeah, everything that even questions that I didn't have, they mm-hmm. were able to answer for me, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. so I felt like it was more so of me searching and them having certain answers that I was looking for. Right. Even but not only that, like you're saying, um, I was vulnerable because I didn't have my family like I didn't have the support of my mom, of my dad, you know, like my family, we weren't really. um too close so to have that additional support was also something that was a benefit for me right so that was another reason why I decided to join the church also and feeling like a celebrity that's a really good uh, explanation yes it's like pop they're like the paparazzi and you're the celebrity yeah Yeah. literally like they would just you know just want to hear everything about my life and just staring at me like, oh, my God, you're here. You're so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'm like, wow, I've never heard any of this before. You know, and it felt <laughs> so good. Mm-hmm. So um, and then there were times I was pregnant at the time. So I was always kind of tired. And it was like at the ending of my um, pregnancy. So there were some days that I didn't want to go just because I was tired, you know, but the one who um, preached to me, she would come to my house, like knocking on my door and like waking me up. And I started to get a little annoyed by that at first. But then um, on like the Sabbath day, I would go to the church and they would do like fragrances. And some members would say things like, oh, you know, um, I was so in the beginning when I first came to the church, I was so slow. But the deaconess didn't give up on me. She would come to visit me and she showed me so much love. So when they would say that, it, it kind of took away that discomfort of her coming to just 
see me anywhere and pop up at my house. Because at first I'm like, this is so weird. You know, you kind of normalize it I, because you're like, oh, they're yeah. doing it to everybody else. And it's a sign of love. Love. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So then and really, they're just trying to check up on you. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, and I had no idea. So mm-hmm. I thought like, oh, wow, this is a way of showing love. And also because I wasn't familiar with that family system, I thought, OK, this is new to me, but I guess this is love, you know. Mm-hmm. So I stopped complaining about that. And um, another thing is like in between the Sabbath day, I would want to go to sleep because I was pregnant. But then um I would be told like, you know, you were you were chosen for a reason, you know, so you have to repay God by being here. So it was instead of like in the beginning, it was more of like, wow, you were chosen by God and you're so lucky. But then eventually, like slowly, it started to turn into, oh, because you were chosen by God. Now you should show God your um, appreciation you know, by being here and by being present and by studying. And the more you study, the more you can repay God and know God. So I would be there all the time. And then, um, so when my yeah. daughter was born, um, I, it was a Friday night and I started to have like my contractions and my mom, I was staying at my mom's house cause I knew it was cl- close to the due date and I couldn't drive. And my husband didn't have papers or whatever so anyway my mom took me to the hospital and on the way there I was crying and she's like what's wrong are you in pain I'm like no I just feel like Satan's attacking me because my baby's going to be born on a Sabbath day and I'm going to miss the Sabbath Mm. and she got so upset she's like what do you mean your child is being born on a Saturday so Satan is controlling this she's like this is a blessing like Mm. why are you being negative about your child being born like, you weren't even supposed to have kids in the first place. Like, why are you thinking mm. that? And that's how... How scared we were to miss the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, that's how scared I was. Because I felt like Satan made my child born on a Sabbath day. So mm. I would miss him. Um, But yeah, that's something I just wanted to... Yeah, yeah. that is so <laughs> interesting. It sucks because it's like... It takes, like your mom said, it like takes away the joy of that moment of you having yeah. your daughter, like in, the, you should have been enjoying it and like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so excited you're having this miracle baby, but instead you're worrying about, you know, being cursed by God because you're going to miss a service because you're in the hospital having a baby. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That is just so sad. Yeah, Exactly. And, so um, did you, the, you had your daughter before you went to El Salvador, right? Yes. And then had, you moved there. Yeah. So when I had her, um, we would we were still kind of like in the beginning phase. So there were days where they would take her to the kids' room, but she's an infant, you know. And I'm like, but I want to be with her. I'm I'm breastfeeding her, and they were encouraging me like, oh, maybe you should just give her the formula, so that way you don't have to be around her. You can study more and you know things like that and then I would hear her cry in the kids room while I'm studying and it just broke my heart and I'm just like I can't concentrate on anything because I just I can hear my baby crying you know like her voice would get raspy and then they would they would say like well you can't let her stop you from you know from your salvation don't let her hinder you and you know like Satan uses children to get there to get us out of the truth so it was kind of like my mind started to be trained to be numb to my daughter wanting to be around me. So I, you know, slowly it became natural for me to just not see her for the entire Sabbath day or whenever I would come to go preaching, it just started to be a normal thing, um, you know, to not see her. Right. It didn't, you know, it stopped affecting me, but um, later on it got, you know, it affected me again, but now, can, you know, start talking about when I moved to El Salvador. Yeah, but I just want to say, like, even though I, I have a similar story, you know, my baby uh, was a, I was away from him a lot. And I feel like even though we sort of like normalized it, I do feel like deep down, like we miss our babies so much. And like, we yeah. knew that that wasn't right. Mm-hmm. You know, like, we, we knew that there was something wrong, but like we also knew that we had to preach. We had to do the gospel work in order for them to be blessed. So it was like yes. it was like they were using the babies against us. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
I think that is one of the most difficult things, you know, is just the way that that is, um, how babies and moms are separated like that. Uh, Amani, in the churches that you went to, did they talk a lot about, um, like, having more children as being a negative thing? Yes. Like, there's something I want to mention about that. Um, there was one sister who was, like, crying when she found out she was pregnant. And I'm like, why are you crying? And she's like, because I won't be able to be, you know, I won't be able to help mother anymore. And I won't be able to be used for the gospel anymore. And now I'm just like, and I'm thinking like, but this was like way later on after I had been in there for years. And that was one of the things that alarmed me. That was one of the red flags that got me to slowly start to not feel that it was the truth anymore. Because I'm like, there's no way that having a child or giving life to a child can be a negative thing. Like, there's no way that God will want us to feel guilty for having children. Right. Yeah. So that was one of the out of like 10 things that kind of like alarmed me. Like, yeah, you know, the light started flashing like, uh, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel great. So, but I feel like when you're a newer member, like how you were, you were yeah. like newly baptized, you have a baby. It's very exciting. People, yeah. did they come to visit you at the hospital? Yes, they did. Yeah, they go visit you at the hospital. Yeah. Um, but if you're a gospel worker and you have a baby, it's mm -hmm. totally different. Yeah. But um, yeah, so then you had your baby. Your baby was like, so what, she was six months old when you moved to El Salvador? Yep. Yeah, so yes, then you and your did. husband and your daughter moved there. How was that? Um, that was interesting because um, we were considered like older members when we went there because the church there was so new and, wow. and the churches in the United States, they were more advanced than mm -hmm. the church in El Salvador because it was very new and um, even the culture is mm. just so different, you know, like right. in third world countries because they struggle financially so much the the gospel isn't as successful or you know the way it is in the united states so because we were coming from the united states we had been in the church for a year they felt like oh wow we have gospel workers coming but we were still pretty new mm -hmm. <laughs> we were still like in that baby stage but they right. saw us as like amazing gospel workers so a lot of pressure was kind of put on us mm. to show the newer members that were being baptized in el salvador like how to be but we would still make mistakes you know because we were also new you're supposed to be a good example. Like if you're yeah. an older member, it's a lot of pressure to be a good example for your younger brothers and sisters. Exactly. So like they would tell us to, you know, like in between services, don't talk about worldly things and make sure everybody is studying and like make sure when you're, you know, during services, you're saying amen really loud <laughs> and that you're singing with a loud voice, you know, like little things like that. We would kind of, you know, we would get in trouble for like, oh, you're not singing loud enough. And, you know, you have to dress a certain way, you have to be conservative and you can't wear too many colors and too much, you know. So it was a different experience for me because when I was in Atlanta, there was not really much expectation. I was just, you know, they were just excited for me to be there. Yeah. But in El Salvador, it was kind of like, no, you got to be like this and this. And I'm like, I'm not a deaconess. I don't really know what I'm doing, you know. So that was kind of the struggle going there. Did you feel like the doctrine was the same in El Salvador? Like were the Bible studies the same and all the teachings were the same? Yes, I do. And another thing is that I had studied so much in Atlanta that we were kind of behind. They were just starting out with like all the studies I had heard when I first got baptized. So it was kind of mm -hmm. like a repetition of everything I had already heard. The only thing that was different was they like during the year 2012 because I was in El Salvador during that time they never preached about the end of the world they just preached about the completion of the temple and they were saying things like after this year no one can be the 144,000 because the temple is complete there were, you know that's the study I remember hearing during that year mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of like oh wow so Everybody I preach to, that means my mom, anybody outside who hasn't been preached to that I ever meet is automatically not 144,000. But then they clean right. that up with saying, hold on to your crown because that place can be taken. So right. it's just a lot. You know? <laughs> Amani, at the time, did you know that other churches were, were being taught that the world was like going to come to an actual end? Or did you find that out later? 
Well, so remember how I said like I would go back and forth to El Salvador and Atlanta? Right, right. So during the year 2012, I visited Atlanta. Mm. And it was after they had already been preaching that a lot. A lot of the members were, um, they quit school. And I would hear little things about it. Like, yeah, this is the year. But it wasn't like a sermon. I never heard a sermon. You know, it was never, you know, things like that. But a lot of the members, because it was like subliminal. So the members understood the message. So they would think like, okay, so that's basically what they're saying. You know, it was so it. weird. It was like you understood, but you weren't allowed to say it with your mouth. It was like yeah. they trained you so that they couldn't be held accountable later. Yeah, exactly. But mm. everyone would do things like sell their houses and, you know, quit school and not have babies and break their houses. apartment leases, get yeah. in all this debt, like so much debt. Mm. And I remember talking to my um, ex-husband at the time from Atlanta and telling him, like, are they saying anything about the end of the world they, um, there? Because I kind of feel like they're doing that here. And he's like, no, I don't. I didn't hear anything about that. So mm -hmm. that was also my comfort, too, because he would tell me that that wasn't true and that wasn't something that they were preaching. Right. Because it's scary. Right. Yeah. Cause it's like everybody acts like they're excited. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, we're going to heaven. Father's coming. But at the same time, you're like trembling because you're like, yeah. I don't really want to die. I mean, I don't really want to see the planet uh, destroyed. You know, I yeah. love my my son. I love my children, like yes. my parents. I don't really want to. I don't know. It's yeah. just so scary. Yeah, it was. But I feel like in El Salvador, they weren't preaching that because the members were really new still. Right. They didn't want to scare the shit out of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that was more of what it was. And in Atlanta, yeah. everybody was so much more mature in, the, right. you know, in their faith that they could kind of say those things and they would still stand firm. So I think that was kind of why it happened that way. Right. But um, so after that was pretty much all that really happened in El Salvador, it was very you know, normal. There wasn't too much expectation. And plus, we live really far from the church. Mm. So it wasn't, you know, much. Did you just go like, like on Sabbath day? That was no. The oh, you didn't? No, we went on Sabbath day. We went, you know, all the feasts, but we would go during the week too, because oh. I didn't work when I was in El Salvador. So I was like, um, you know, one of the gospel worker mommies. So my daughter would be in the kids room during the day. I would also help with lunch. It was just, you know, it wasn't, it didn't feel pressure. It just felt like a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, That's a good way to put it. It was a lifestyle. Yeah. And you embraced it. You're like, I have a two hour drive. I don't care. I'm yeah. going to get my blessings. Exactly. <laughs> I'll it listen to new feel. songs the whole way there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or practice my sermons I or sermons <laughs> yes and they would start putting sermons in like a like audio so you could listen to it like constantly having it in your in your mind yeah that was you know I never felt and at that time everything I wanted to do I you know I did and it wasn't any issue or anything like that yeah. but um, so so then you move back to the states right so then you go to Jacksonville is that where you No, went? I went to Tampa, and then okay, I was okay. kind of back and forth between right, Tampa right. and um, Atlanta. So Tampa was like my favorite Zion that I went to because the leader there was so, first of all, he was super funny. He was just very... Um, was he Korean? Just curious. No, 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 oh. no. He's white. But he was amazing. Like, I really, really liked his personality, and he never made me feel like something was wrong with me, you know, like, and he, he liked everyone to be themselves. And I wasn't used to that in El Salvador. We were, you know, very strict and we couldn't really show too much personality. You know, it was kind of like, let's all be the same to make everyone feel comfortable and, you know, things like that. But in Tampa, it was very, you know, we would do like karaoke. We like, even like during preaching meeting, I remember the first preaching meeting I went to, he's like, so after preaching, the most important thing we got to do afterward is get ice cream. And I'm just like, Aww, what? I've never heard that before, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I even mentioned to him, I'm like, that's so weird that you're, you know, the most important thing is to get ice cream. You know, I was thinking you were going to say bear fruit or bring someone back 
or you know mm-hmm. something like that. Steady. Yeah. And he was like, but why? He's like, why do you feel like getting ice cream is bad? I'm like, because I've always been told it. It it's it's like not a good thing to indulge in the world. Right. Right. And then he'll be like, so then who do you think God made ice cream for? <laughs> the sinners that aren't in Zion, really? Do you think God would do that to His children? Like you mm-hmm. know things like that. He would just make mm-hmm. jokes like that. Mm-hmm. And then um. And then he he also like asked me how was my experience in El Salvador and I would explain how strict it was, and then he'll just be like I go I go why do uh, those Koreans do that I go yeah yeah so he was like really cool so I love yeah. being in Tampa and um and then also during Thanksgiving my mom had like she cooked a lot of food and she wanted you know, me and our family to get together, but also in Zion, they had something going on. So I didn't go. And when I got home, she was livid. She was so mad at me. And um, because at the time, Thanksgiving was told that it was a pagan feast during But then you can go to the church and eat. That's what's so confusing. Yeah, no, but now (laughs) they say that they never said it was pagan, that we can go. So that's why it's kind of like, when, like, I don't know, it was just contradicting after a while but in the beginning it was considered a pagan feast and that we shouldn't go um and participate in it boom i knew it (laughs) yeah so then um my mom like she didn't really kick me out but it just got really uncomfortable after that so the leader in tampa was like oh you know you can stay with this sister if you want so like they accepted me in you know like just invited me into her house and i was living with her for a few months you know because I didn't feel comfortable living with my mom at the time. So that was another thing I wasn't used to, um, being able to live with a sister. Because before we couldn't even talk to each other once we walked out the door, it was like, all right, we're going home and we can't talk to each other. And, you know, so I was so used to that being the the way to act towards each other. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's when, after that, Um, Because I only was in Tampa, not even a year. So then I moved to Jacksonville. Um, And during the time I was in Tampa, my ex-husband was in El Salvador. Uh, Oh, yeah, I mentioned that. But um, when I moved to Jacksonville, he came back to the States. So Jacksonville was very chill. It was very, um, it wasn't really, it was also family oriented, but there was like no pressure at all. It was like, Whatever we can get out of you is, a, you know, is good. If you want to come preaching, that's amazing. If not, we're not going to force you, you know. And was it I a big church? Was it like hundreds of people? Like maybe no, 20 people? No, it was very small. It, small. Was a, it was an office church. Okay, okay. Yeah, it was an office church. We had maybe like 50 members, I think, okay. including the kids. Okay. Um. So, but yeah, it was very, you know normal we went preaching and you know everything was good but then um the leader the overseer changed um at first it was a korean overseer and i never really met him before he hadn't like gone to the churches and interacted with the other churches because you know like the overseers in charge of like a certain amount of churches in that area right um so two an overseer after- is a pastor same name same word as a pastor Lindsay. oh yeah. Okay. Sometimes we the Bible calls them overseers and pastors. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. She oh, looked no, kind of no. confused. Yeah. So when the overseer changed um, from the Korean overseer to a, I think he was a yeah missionary at the time. He was from the north. I don't remember what state he came from, but he came like from, from the- like New York area ish. Yeah. I I know he was close with um, pastor in New York. Mm -hmm. So I just knew he came from that area. So when he came down, um, he visited all the Zions and he would just, you know, introduce himself and he would give like a sermon and I guess kind of get to know all the members and see who had the most potential to be trained to be Mm -hmm. a gospel worker. But like all that time I had been there, I knew that there were different levels and ranks, but I didn't know that it was you know, that that mattered about your salvation. You know, I didn't know there was a certain level that they considered like, oh, your salvation is more secure when you look like this or when you do this. I thought because I went to Sabbath day, because I didn't miss a service, 
because I um, passed over. Yeah, I thought that I was doing what I needed to do for my salvation. But when they came, they basically were like, you guys are just law keepers. Like this isn't really you're not really gospel workers. You're not really doing anything for God at all. You know, just by keeping the law that it's not really doing anything. So I that was a shock to me. I had never heard anything like that before. So, um, you know, they would say things like you guys are very behind and, you know, you're slower than the members up in New York. So then we were kind of like, okay, well, can you teach us what we should be doing? Because our faith is here. Our love for God is here. We've just never been taught anything outside of what you see. Um, So that's when we we all we had like this huge um, joint worship in Tampa. Um, And they had like a big study with the pastor from New York. And through that study, they kind of made it clear if a sheep and an ox, you know, it was kind of like it was about that subject, really, to show like even in Zion, there's a division. There's the weaker ones and then the stronger ones. So, of course, everybody's like, I want to be a stronger one. What can I do? You know, what can I do to show that I'm a stronger one, (laughs) you know, stronger member? So, um that's interesting. Can I just say something really quick? Yeah. What I'm just realizing right now is like you get this us versus them mentality as far as like we're God's people and those are unbelievers. So mm-hmm. already you're like, OK, but then even within the church, it breaks down even more because even within the church, mm-hmm. they create an us versus them mentality between yeah. God's people because they say, oh, there's the lazy and wicked servant, even in God's people. They say the Bible is only for God's people. So when it's talking about the lazy and wicked, it's talking about God's people in the church. Yes. And that's what scares the shit out of you because you're like, oh, my God, what if that's me? What if I'm the one that didn't prepare the oil? You know, like they're like, that's not talking about unbelievers. That's talking about you. Yes. Like all the scariest verses are about you. Mm-hmm. Not about the b- unbelievers. They're not even. They don't even believe in the Bible. They're already damned. They're already, you know, condemned. Do you yeah. feel like it? Did it feel like that before 2012, or did it kind of happen after that? It didn't happen until the leader came from New York. Yeah. Like, Tony, do you feel like at your in in Denver was it like that? Like always? I think that it's always been like that, but you don't know it until you get deeper in. That's exactly like how she said. Like yeah. Like she thought she was doing okay because she kept Passover and Sabbath and everything is fine. But then once you become a leader and a gospel worker and you start going to those meetings and those those Bible studies that are only for gospel workers because they don't allow everybody in those meetings. Yeah. And then you become a house church leader. Then there's only house church leader meetings. Then there's only pastor meetings. So they have something called the General Assembly and only pastors, only Korean pastors are allowed to go. There might be like one or two Americans, but other than that, they're only Korean. So there's only like 40 of them or however many there are. And they all go and meet with mother and general pastor. Mm-hmm. So it's like there's different levels. So I'm sorry. I just I realized when you talked about that story of the ox and the sheep, I'm like, yeah. oh, my God, even within the group, there's us versus them. Yeah. And it's like, God, that is so culty. Yeah. And so controlling and so it's scary. Yeah. Like yeah. never you're never going to be good at that. It's so yeah. manipulative like ever. Training that must be on an on a daily basis to be mm-hmm. like. If I don't do this one thing correct, I mean, you're just. But you try, you break your back trying. Like you spent 5 a.m. to 2 a.m. You're working your ass off trying to get to heaven. But they don't want you to feel like what you're doing is good enough. Like they'll say things like, oh, you know, in Korea, mother gave a sermon and she she told everyone to raise your hand if you want to be the great multitude. And they'll say, and you know who raised their hand? General right. pastor. Are um, they trying to say that he's humble? He's so humble or something? Not that he's so humble, but that it's so difficult to enter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, that yeah. It's so hard. Like, even oh, because they'll be like, even Apostle Paul was a great multitude. Even yeah. Peter was a great multitude. Even Noah was a multitude. Yeah. Is, your, is your faith greater than Noah? Exactly. Is your faith greater than Apostle Paul? Is your faith greater than General Pastor? Yeah. You know, And then so you're like, oh, shit, it's not. I have to do everything that I can. Yep. So then they'll ask, like, so if you were to die right now or if father were to come right now, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Every day. Every Every day day. you're taught that. Every day. 
for 12, yeah. 13, 14 years, you're taught that. Yes. That shit does something to you. I'll tell you what. Oof. That I gives know. you real trauma. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm so happy <sighs> that you guys are free from that now. Me too. Let's smoke to that. Feel right. Yes. Take a hit for that like you have your freedom. But you guys. Yeah. Oh, I'm just so grateful of that. I get to look at you today. Oh, you're not in there. Yeah. Right. Me too. I think about that every day now. Like, wow, what would I be doing right now? For sure. So when you were in Jacksonville, that just sounds like that was the most intense time. So that was when they were training you guys, right? So they were well, training no, that, you and your husband. That was in Miami. Okay. Okay. Oh, in Miami. In Miami. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So they would say things like, oh, we have a lot of work to do with them. You know, we got a lot of work <sighs> to do with these these Florida members they're just so you know slow and comfortable so they started to send members from New York to Florida to show us what we should be doing to whip you into shape yeah yeah to whip us into shape and some of the things that they would do is like I noticed that when the missionary or deaconess would give them um like a I guess a command or something to do they'll be like yes missionary yes deaconess yes yes you know like that and I'm just like where did that come from? Aren't we all sinners? Like, aren't we all like, I don't know. It was just a lot. And I'm just like, oh, okay. So that's one thing. And then another thing they would do is like right after service, they would get up and clean and then go to the kitchen. Like they wouldn't stop. Like just keeping the Sabbath day wasn't enough. You couldn't just sit there. You had to be, you had to be studying. You had to be preaching. And they'd be like, oh, well, we can go preaching in between services. Let's go down the street and preach and let's do this. And it was just like, Oh, okay. This is what we're so this is what gospel worker looks like. So that's when we started changing and that's when you know like we started to have like committees like okay, you had the bathroom committee and you have the kids room duty and you know like it was just work. lists, so many lists and sign up sheets yep. and donation sheets. Yes. <laughs> so crazy that's when that was because it never um, existed before i never yeah. saw that before that's when all of that started happening the committees and all of that yeah <laughs> so um so did you did you ever have like a seminar training before you were sent off to the house churches or um yeah. like did you ever like live in the church for training live in the church well in el salvador i lived in the church Okay. Actually, at, at the ending of my stay in El Salvador, we lived there for a bit. Um, That's very common for, for yeah. church leaders. So I was curious. Yes. Yeah. It's a lot right. of communal living and mm-hmm. communal eating and sharing space and no yeah. privacy. Yeah. Because we. So that must have been hard on your marriage having like no privacy. That's yeah. what I was gonna ask. Yeah. When, when this is all happening, was your husband um, at the time, was he like into it or was he also kind of like, this is getting. It awesome. sounds like he was always yeah. into it, right? Yeah, like from always, the beginning. He was the one that they considered had the stronger faith in the relationship. Mm. He was the one that would stay later and study. And he like his guilt was way more, you know, like I'm because I would tell him, like, let's go eat somewhere. Let's go do something. You know, don't you miss going out? And he's just like, no, I just feel so bad, you know, like. There's a study going on right now. I don't want anything we do to interfere with the gospel, but there's always something going on there. There's never a dull moment. (laughs) You know, there's never something not to do. There's always more you can do and more you can do. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. if you're waiting for a time that there's nothing to do, then we're never going to see each other. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't get, we we have to be the ones to decide when we can participate and when we can't. And we have to be comfortable with that. But he was never comfortable. He always felt like, he was a sinner or he was being disobedient by going out with us, with me and um, your daughter. So, um, so yeah. Um, so that's when we became house church leaders because, um, once the Miami church got too full, they got the temple, um, a bigger temple, but then as they got the temple, they started to branch out and have house churches. And my family was sent as like helpers with one of the couples that came from New York. So we were sent to a house church in Homestead. So you were sent with somebody from New York? Yes. And it uh, was, were they American or? They were, um, they're Colombian. Okay. Yeah, they're Colombian, but yeah. pretty American to me. You know, they were, they had that. American- so you guys all spoke Spanish? Yes. And where were you guys sent again? I'm sorry. Homestead. Are there a lot of Spanish speakers over there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had they started doing like one service in Spanish. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
See, yeah. stuff like that I loved. Like, I loved that, that everybody could, yes. you know, like, we would have translators during service, and, like, you know, you could sit with your brothers and sisters that didn't speak English. They could mm-hmm. speak any language, but you still felt, like, so close to them and connected yeah. to them. That's mm-hmm. one thing that I really loved and that I really miss, you know. Right. But that but became I'm a sorry. problem in Miami because mm. there were so many Spanish members that they would get, like, the leaders would get kind of, like, upset, like, you know, this is America, we shouldn't be speaking Spanish, and, you know, you're God's children, and you should be able, you know, you have the Holy Spirit, you got to learn English, and the members would kind of, it would be a back and forth, and they would complain, like, yeah, but we don't understand the sermons, we want to hear the word of God, you know, we want to hear it in our own language, and it's like, well, that's the fault of those who preach to you, because we should be just preaching to Americans anyway, type of thing, that was kind of like the argument back and forth, so that was a huge thing. There was a time where I actually got to translate too, and I was really proud of myself for that. But I That's a huge blessing being the translator, yeah. especially during service, is yeah. like a huge blessing. Yeah. Because you feel like you're like translating the word of God. So it's very serious. You have to like pray before you do it, ask mm-hmm. for God's blessing and everything. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just wanted to mention that. Because I used to give the closing prayer, you guys, but like before you do the closing prayer. Like you pray before you do the closing prayer. Then you do the closing prayer. Like the closing prayer is like where you get up on the altar. You pray like for the service. And then you come down, you come back to your seat, and then you pray again. Yeah. No, but like you pray for the prayer. prayer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like you pray to pray. Mm-hmm. And then you pray because you prayed. Yeah. And then if you're going to drive anywhere, <laughs> if you're driving yes. anywhere, you got to pray to drive and then pray that you got there safe when you get I there. I told you. And I told you. If you didn't pray, it was kind of like, oh, you think you can drive without God's help? Amani, I have to tell you something, okay? I just realized it this week. Just what? realized it. What? I started having panic attacks when I drove. After I left the church, I started having severe panic attacks like on the highway. Mm-hmm. And it was so scary. Yeah. And I didn't know what the hell was happening. I actually like ended up in the hospital and everything. And then I just realized, I oh. just realized that we used to pray before we drove every okay. time. And if you didn't, you thought that you were going to get into a car accident. Yeah. And I think that now I'm like driving and I feel like in my subconscious mm-hmm. somewhere like, I'm not protected. I'm going to get into a severe accident and die or something, you know? Yeah. And I think somehow that caused panic attacks. Yeah. I haven't had any reason. I haven't had any, but I don't drive on the highway because I'm afraid of panic attacks. Wow. But when you said that, I was just like, oh my God, I told Lindsay this like a week ago. I'm like, I just realized yeah. Because it was so important to pray before you drive. Like that was just something. And then when you prayed before you drove, you felt like you could do anything. Like yeah. I'd be in a blizzard and I'd just be like, I have father and mother's protection. Like yeah. singing new songs. And like, I didn't care. I swear mm-hmm. to God, I felt so protected. Yeah. I 100% felt like that. So then I think when that protection, quote unquote, was taken away, you're just like, oh, shit. Yeah, you feel so exposed. and You open. feel so exposed, like, like yeah. so naked and yeah. so vulnerable. Right, exactly. Naked. Damn, that's so crazy. And do you guys think off of the top of your heads, and, and we can revisit this because I feel like it's something maybe to think about. Is there any other, like, um, behavior or activity that you would have acted recklessly thinking that you were protected like that? I mean, I know like during 2012, people were like selling their houses and doing yeah. things like that. Oh, yeah, that's job, a perfect example. My job, like if I had to request a day off and I didn't have any more vacation time available, I would pray and I'd be like, hey boss, I got to take off next week. And I'm going to, you know, I felt so powerful because I'm like, God, you know, God, God is with me. Her. Yeah. It does give you power. It gives you power to do shit that you never would. Like you yeah. confront your boss and they're and you're like, if you don't give me the time off, I don't care. I'm going to quit. And you yeah. do. You quit and you don't give a shit if you don't have another job lined up. You don't care. Mm-mm. You lose your house and everything. Like, it's OK. You literally do not care. Like you will laugh about it with your brothers yeah. and sisters. You're just like, oh, and well, you can boast about it. Like, oh, guess what? I got kicked out of my house because I quit my job and I don't have a job. And, I don't and they'll be like, oh, you're God. so blessed. You gave all that up for father and mother. Wow. Yeah. Let's appoint you a deaconess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stressful. 
No, it's so <laughs> fucked up. People give away everything. They yeah. leave their children, dude. Yes. People have left their children. Oh. Everything. People they leave everything so for the shit. And <sighs> yeah. The problem is how good you feel doing it. You know, you're like, oh, my child is in the kids' room and they're not eating, but they're going to be fine because I know God is going to protect them. Yep. There's so many days that my daughter would just be in the kids' room and I would feel so good about it. Like, wow, look how good of a gospel worker I am. I don't let my child hinder me from the gospel and yep. look how strong I am. Meanwhile, And then my you daughter- start feeling <laughs> boastful. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's bad. It, it's, it, it's interesting what, what happened to us. That was our cult identity, though. That wasn't us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? At so all. So that's interesting. Right. But what one thing that I did keep was my love for people. You know, mm-hmm. like, I never let that mentality stop me from... Um, you know, wanting to help people who struggled, you know, like if they were going through something, I never felt like, oh, look at you, you're so weak. And oh, you don't have faith. I never felt like that. Because I'm like, there's going to be a time where I need help. And you know, I want someone to be there for me, because you don't really have that support. You don't have that person to go to and talk to like, you know, I'm feeling this or you know, I'm going through this. And it's like, you have to pretend that you're okay all the time, even if you're not. And that right there is what broke me the most. Because it's like, I'm losing my job. I'm getting treated bad at work. You know, like the regular life that everybody else goes through, you know, you can't show that you're affected by it. Because if you do, it's kind of like, oh, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Oh, you you don't have faith. Yeah. And it's like, no, I'm just a human. And my emotions, you know, exist. You know, like I was created to feel pain because that's just how it happens you know like there's no way I can just pretend that everything is fine when it's not so you're kind of taught that you should do that but yeah so when I was in the house church one thing that I hated the most was how the female leader would try to control my relationship with my daughter you know like try to control how much I spent time with her and what we would do when I picked her up from school and she would go to my daughter and ask her, like, oh, you know, when you got off school, what happened? Where did you, where did you guys go? Because it takes a certain amount of time to get to um, Zion, and it took you, you know, a little longer than that. Did you guys go anywhere or stop anywhere? And my daughter would be like, oh, yeah, we went to McDonald's, and I got a Happy Meal. <laughs> and then she would come to me like, so Lily told me that you guys went to, you know, McDonald's when you got home. I mean, before you got home and <gasps> where you like, do you see the house church? We don't have furniture. We don't have this. We don't have that. And you're over here. How taking dare you? Mm. Yeah. And I'm like, I can do whatever I want. I want to explain the dynamic of a house church you guys, because when, okay. So there's usually two couples. Yeah. Like the main couple and then the, the um, like helper couple. Mm hmm. And Amani was the helper couple. Yeah. But like the the female is like in charge of everything. Like the, the, the main the main female is like in charge of everything. The children, the cleaning, the cooking, everything, the preaching, yeah. everything. But her little like helper is like her slave. Mm-hmm. Like like yeah. like the helper is just all, always have to be on the beck and call of like the main church leader. Does yeah. that make sense? Yep. Like, like, I, you're like, I, like, just knowing you for a short amount of time, I cannot imagine you in that role. <laughs> it's so awful that she would, you know, use your daughter. And I'm sure she was always like strict about your time and your money. I mean, it probably wasn't even, it was about the time and it was also about the money. Like, yeah. why, you know, why are you spending money on that? Yes. I'm so sorry. But yeah, that's like a common thing is for the for the female leaders to be so strict. And then you as a church helper are also expected to be strict on the other sisters. Yeah. So it's like a continuous like military style, you know, training, training, training to be God's soldiers. Mm-hmm. And then it's like if some member feels close to you and they want to tell you their personal life and the leader kind of picks up on that. She's like, what did she say? But well, what's going on with her? Oh, she yeah. Teaching yesterday. Did she tell you anything about herself? And it's like, no, she did it. You know, I, I would lie because I, I don't like to tell Aww. people's business. Because You're like, I, I'm not a snitch. That's nice. Yeah. That's I nice, never Vivian. wanted to do that. But they yeah. would like pressure you. Like, I know she told you something. And I, cause mm. she's close to you and, and you guys work together. Or, you know, I know you, you know, and it would just be that. And I'm like, I don't feel comfortable 
telling her personal business, if she didn't come to you and tell you herself, then obviously she doesn't want you to know, you know, and they would look at me like, oh, you're so like, I don't know, like, I just felt like I was doing something wrong only based on the way they perceived it. But I never felt guilty for not telling someone's business because I didn't feel, I would feel worse telling on someone than I would not telling. <laughs> My conscience was more clear by keeping their secret safe. And Every I think day. sometimes, I think sometimes we sort of dissociate it is what it's called, where like, mm. like I was talking about a cult identity, like you almost... Your brain, I th your mind, I think, sometimes protects us, you know, like mm -hmm. when we're in those dangerous or like traumatic situations and yeah. sort of like puts it away so that we don't remember it. I don't know, because like with those panic attacks, I didn't really understand. Yeah, I didn't even know they were panic attacks. Right. You know, like I just thought I was dying. Yeah, Every no day I thought I had some rare disease. I'm like, I have cancer. I have this. I have fibromyalgia. I had every yeah. single disease in the world. I was such a hypochondriac because I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. And Come to find scary. out it's all that trauma and anxiety. Yes. It's scary because you feel like you can't do anything. But right. in reality, you can. You know, like even before the podcast is like, uh, I want to pray before to make sure it goes out right, but I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm saying. Like, right. I was given the ability to speak and to, you know, like, we feel like we can't do anything or that we're incapable of doing something. And that's because of that, you know, that mentality that was pushed onto us. But in reality, we are powerful on our own. You know, we are, we are capable of knowing right from wrong where you know we're capable of knowing all these things but we we're, we assume that we're not but we really are right like we give all thanks to father and mother all the time for everything and like but when I look back I'm like oh shit that wasn't father mother that was me and I did that and yeah. I was strong and I freaking girl mm -hmm. do you know how much shit we did that we would never ever expect to be able to do like all the things that you did in there that was yeah. you that was yeah. not god and so that's really powerful when you look back and you're like Shh, if i can do that mm -hmm. i can do anything if i can get yes. up at 5 a.m every single day three yeah. times a year for you know 10 20 days straight yeah. You know, and like never miss a preaching meeting, all those things like we you we're so strong for all those yeah. things that we went through. Exactly. And I see like myself now, like a lot of the things that I would doubt in myself before I'm able to do now, like without hesitation, like. Right. Like starting my own business. And I don't know, I just feel so powerful now. Right. You know, That's like awesome. I don't doubt anything I do. And the people around me, they're just it's so genuine The relationships that I have in my life now, they're so they're unconditional and they're genuine, real relationships. And it's not like, oh, if I don't, if, I, if I'm late to a study, you know, then I, I won't have my friends anymore. Like if we were be late for a study meeting, the people we thought we were close to would look at us like, oh, we're not friends anymore. You were late you for a study. The meeting. worst looks and yeah, worst. Yeah. And it's like, what happened to our bond? Like, you mm. don't know what happened. You don't know why I'm late. Yeah, you don't know what I'm going through. So why are you judging me? And why are you treating me different now that I'm going through something at my lowest point? That is not love. That's not family. That's not something that I want my daughter to learn. You know, like after like now when I see what real love is, I look back and I'm like, that was so that was controlled love. And it was conditional, very conditional. One little thing you did wrong, you're out of the door. It's like, no, we don't love you anymore. You, you know, you did this or you look like this or, you know, you wore pants or something. It's just like, wow, that is not love. Amante, okay. you and I are going to talk about this offline about hearing you guys talk. It's it's so interesting that um, God is presented as like God is God is the right. The devil is the bad. And and we kind of talked about that sensation that like you in the middle, you're not your own self. Yeah. And like, why would God create you like that? Just the, it's like it contradicts everything that like the concept of God is, is that like God created you in his image and you're perfect. And like all of the things yeah. that you follow the biblical context or even, you know, mm -hmm. if you think that God created you exactly how he wanted you, that's so contradictory because then it's like, well, you're not capable of making. Right. Your own. 
Exactly. You're not capable of making people work on their own. And that's that doesn't mean God is that does not make God omniscient and om, and om, omnipotent or whatever the words are, you know, uh-huh. like so you're saying God is perfect and God doesn't make mistakes. But yet he made me and I'm a mistake. Like, how does that make sense? Yeah, like I'm hour, not keep- hourly everything is a sin that you have to like work above to in order to make it to heaven. Like, yeah. I don't think that like just that very basic concept from a philosophical context like that just doesn't make any sense and it doesn't it it basically it's like our psyche what what controls our emotions what controls our love what controls us to be a good person like our own consciousness is what allows us to feel and relate to other people's pain but they they train you to get rid of that they train you to be numb to the suffering of other people but then how can i love them yeah. You know, how can I really genuinely love the people around me and the people that I'm trying to save and preach to if we shouldn't care about their mental health and care about their, you know, like their well-being? How it's so contradicting, like, you know, like even with our child, like, oh, if they're sick, oh, they'll be fine. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to miss service because your child is sick, then that means you don't love God. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It was just very hard to show love because it was so conditional. Yeah. You know, and one of the the things I I remember this, this really pissed me off when I found this out. Tony said it in an earlier episode that she went to her pastor and she was like, I just cannot like get ahead of like money. Like, um, do you have any advice for me? And he was Mm -hmm. like, you're being punished for some sin. Right, Tony? Mm-hmm. Or he just said, you know, it's just your sinful nature. You need to overcome it. You need to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Pray. That's, that's <laughs> saying anything bad that happens to you is like, God, you piss God off and you got to figure out a way to like reconcile that. Yeah, that's exactly. Up, because life is hard and bad shit happens and like it's nobody's fault most of the time. Yeah. Know? They make it seem like anything bad happening to you is your fault. Like, oh, you must. And even if you're sick, if you get sick, they're like, oh, the spiritual, the physical world reflects spiritual. That means your soul is sick right now. Right. So it's like you're trying to pretend you're not sick. I'm not sick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're, like, you're not trying to cough. Yeah. You're trying to act mm-hmm. like everything is good. Mm-hmm. Like you don't. <laughs> you feel just, guilty it's... for stuff that you shouldn't feel guilty for. It's so stupid. Yeah. So yeah. you were in it for so long, Amani. I mean, how long? It was a total of 12 years. Holy crap. But, um, 12 years. How did you... How did you find, like, what made you want to leave? Because 12 years is so Mm -hmm. long. I mean, you were indoctrinated day after day after day for 12 years. Yeah. How do you get out of that? So there were a few red flags that started to actually affect me. And the main one was the thing I told you about the girl crying about being pregnant. That was one thing that was kind of just like, that's not right. Another thing was how um they would say like so we, we were in a meeting like all the leaders because I was a team leader then they were we were in a meeting and the leader the main leader the overseer the elder oh, put a picture up of the, of the church and he's like can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture and then we're like uh you know we're looking at it like I don't know like what do you mean and he's like the picture's too dark and I'm like we're like what do you mean it's too dark and he's like, yeah, it looks like this is a um, church from Haiti. Why are all oh. the conversation? Oh, my God. Yeah. And I'm like. Oh, he so was talking about the members. It was like a, like a picture of all the members. Yes. It was a picture <sighs> of our church that mm-hmm. we attended. Uh-huh. And he's like, um, when we show this picture in Korea, it looks like this picture came from Haiti, not from Miami. Yeah. And he's just like, you know what? From now on, we're not preaching to any more Haitians. And I was like, was there a lot of Haitian members? Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of Haitian members. Because that's, I mean, have you been to Miami? I mean, that's like, it's a very diverse place. It's beautiful. Like, uh, dude, have you been to America? That's like the whole point of America. (laughs) Nobody, nobody like. Yeah. Yeah, But I I feel like that's a common thing is like, they want a lot of white people. I don't know why. It's just. Yeah. It's because they feel like, well, it's money. You know, like, and they would say like, oh, the Haitian members, they just come here and eat and leave. And Ugh. we don't want that, you know, and, and then they would say things like, um, 
So when when they started saying that, I would still preach to everyone because I'm like, it's not about what they look like. You know, mm-hmm. you're telling us not to work, worry about the physical life, you know, and our soul is what matters. So then why does the color of our skin matter? Like, how does that have anything to do with our salvation? So I started to see it wasn't about saving souls anymore. It didn't matter. Like my purpose of being there was to participate in that mission of saving the world. I wanted to be a part of that. And because it started to be, you know, oh, preach to, you know, the youth or people that have titles or, you know, their their physical status, you know, in the world, it started to be more about, you know, their positions and doctors and lawyers. We had to go towards that. And it's like, yeah, don't you want to offer good fruit to God? Why would you, you start you- going to nicer neighborhoods preaching door to door instead of like the ghetto neighborhoods? But yeah. Amani, let me ask you a question. When you were preaching, this is my personal experience. I would have rather preached to somebody that was not white. How about you? Me too. I hated preaching to white people. Hated it. Do you know why? (laughs) Yeah. They were so fucking arrogant. And that's why everybody wanted a white fruit because they were the hardest fruit to get. Yeah. Because white people do not want to be approached to talk about religion. Okay. White people are kind of jerks. And so I'd be like so nervous to preach to white people and they'd always be like, push you in the front. Like the Koreans would push you up to preach to the white person. And I'm like, I don't want you. I want to go preach to the Mexican family over there because they were nice. And that, you know, the Mexican culture is like to talk about God. It's more open and they were friendlier and they were nicer Mm -hmm. and the white people were scary. Yeah. Yeah. But they would compare it to like, offering fruit to God like oh if you Mm -hmm. offer a Haitian fruit it's kind of like offering a molded fruit to God yep and a white fruit was like like a white cleaned up well professional like wealthy white fruit was like the best juiciest fruit yeah and that to me was like I don't think that's I don't think that's something that God cares about like I don't Mm -hmm. like if our purpose is to go to heaven in our spiritual form I don't get the connection. So that's kind of what started, you know, turning me off with the whole church. And another thing was that when we moved to the temple, the temple was a mess. It did not look good. So my ex-husband was really good with construction. So they took advantage of his skills, like to the max, like he would get off work and go there and be there till 2 a.m., And I would just be like, you know, you don't feel tired. Like, Mm -hmm. so I would ask him, like, you know, I know you're, you know, you're in in church and you feel like this is important, but don't you miss your family? Like, don't you want to spend time with me and our daughter? But he would feel like, no, like, what's the point of that? How is that going to benefit my soul at all? Spending time with you. So to me, it was kind of like, you're like, gee, thanks. Yeah. You know, (laughs) and it's like, well, so then what's the point of having a family? Right. You know, what's the whole point of having this connection or having this bond if we can't interact with each other? So I would like go to the leaders and ask them, like, can you please explain to us what our roles as husband and wife are and our roles as parents? Because I don't feel like a mother. I don't feel like I can have that, ti- you know, have that title and actually be a good mother to my child without being looked at as a bad gospel worker. Like, How do I balance both of them without feeling like I'm going to go to hell for taking my child out to be a child? You know, like, please explain how I can do that. And, you know, and then they would say things like, yeah, mother loves family. Mother loves family. Like, what do you mean? We we love family. Think about it. We're the only church that think that believes in mother, father and children. Of course, we love family. But here we come Sabbath day. They would have like members come from Korea and they'll be like, can you please stand up? Look, these members came from Korea and they left their families behind. They are so amazing. Look how beautiful. Yeah. Everybody That's so true. We love you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they so then that would make the members at the church think like, oh, okay. So then it's a good thing to leave my family mm-hmm. behind. It's a good thing to neglect my family. So yeah. I should be praised like that. So that right. means you know, so it what they never said to neglect your family but they would right. do little things like that like wow look at brother he is working so hard and he's going to receive 10 stars in the kingdom right. of heaven right. you know that's really what they say oh yes. for sure for sure that's what there's like videos about how you know receiving galaxies and stars yeah. 
So he would feel like, okay, so I'm not getting praise for being a good father. I'm not being praised for being a good husband. I'm oh, yeah. If you're a good father or a good husband, you'll be shunned. Yeah. It's like, you'll be oh, looked down on. More than God. His family is his idol. You know, That's like, why it's really sad family. to me because, because your husband, it sounds like, really just wants to believe in God and just really wants to be blessed. And they're yeah. just totally manipulating that. And so okay. it is sad because it totally broke up your marriage. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this was your husband that you knew since high school. So it was like right. somebody that you came in with. It wasn't somebody yes. that you met in the church. And so yeah. I just felt so sorry to you and your daughter because... Mm -hmm. It's like he's just being manipulated so yeah. much, you know, that it's like it's almost like a drug addict. Like, yeah, like like, you know, that it's not them. So there's still a part of you that feels mm -hmm. sorry for them. You yes. Know? But exactly. at the same time, it's too hurtful to you. And so you have to break ties. And yes. So, it's It was too painful, like just to yeah. see you know, my child just be in the kids room alone by herself yeah. all the time. Right. You know, because no other parent left their kids that long. It would always right. be me and him because he did construction. I was in choir. I was a team leader. I studied with all the members, yeah. not all of them, but I studied with some members and, you know, I never felt guilty about it. But then after a while, I started to feel guilty. You know, it was just like, it happened so often that I would look at my daughter and I'm like, I have no idea who she is. You know, like, I don't even know her. So I stopped. I, I started to slow down. I'm like, you know what? Every Sunday, it's your day, baby. <laughs> you know? So, like, That's really good. We are going to have brunch every Sunday. We're going to go to the park. And then I thought that my husband would see that and be like, oh, I missed that. But never. He would go to soccer practice, soccer fellowship every Sunday before we woke up and just would never be home any Sunday. And it's just like, you don't feel bad that we're here enjoying each other's company. And it would be like, no, I, he, he would feel bad for us for not being a part of the church on Sundays. And I'm just like, this is so backwards. Like, this is, cannot be what God wants. Like, I want to be with my daughter. I want to be with my family. Like... And I felt I felt like I was looked at as like a, you know, like a, like I was damaged because of that reason. Like, oh, you were like you're tempting like, him or like trying yeah. to pull him away. Yes. It's like, oh, you know, you better be careful because she's looked like she's going to pull you out of the church because of yeah. that. You know, yeah. so um, another thing I wanted to mention was when we finally left the church, you we, and your daughter. Yes. Me and my daughter. We, we right. finally left and we moved to um, Charlotte, or we went to like Atlanta for a little bit, but we finally established ourselves in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And um, she would still go back and visit him. She would go visit him and then come see me because he was there, you know, but I stopped going to the church, but I didn't tell him that because I just didn't want to have that problem, you know? So I'm like, let's just not tell him that we're going, that we're not going. Um, but she was on board 100% about not going to the church. She didn't want to go anymore. But when she went to Florida, she did want to go because all of the kids she knew were there. Right. You know, she was close with the deaconess. There. That's where she was raised. That's where yeah. she was. Yeah, That's that was her knew. home. Yeah. And so when she would go there, she would want to go to the church, you know, and then she would cry when she had to leave. And she would say things like, oh, I really want to be here. But I have to go back with my mom. But then when she come here, she would be like, oh, I really don't want to go there because, you know, like, I don't want to be just stuck in the kids room all by, by myself all the time. So it was like contradicting at right. one point. I'm right. kind of like, so are you lying to me or are you lying to your dad? She was probably you know? just stuck. She like, you know, she didn't know. She probably had both of those. It's confusing. confusing. Yeah. yeah. So that's when, you know, I'm like, I don't want to put anything in her mind. I want it to be her own decision. So I hired a therapist for her and for me. So um, she would do her sessions like by herself. And then afterwards, the therapist would talk to me um. and tell me things that she would worry about, you know. And then um, she was like, basically, the problem is your daughter doesn't know what love is. She doesn't know how to tell when somebody loves her for her or when they love her based on what she's doing. Oh. She feels like the the engine to the love she's receiving is in her actions. Oh. So that's why she's lying to you. That's the reason why she's lying. And she's like, and you need to teach her that she doesn't need to do anything at all. Mm -hmm. You have to teach her that 
unconditional love is the true love. And when the therapist told me this, it had clarified everything that I was already feeling in the first place. And she's like, somewhere along the line, she has the idea that if she doesn't do a certain thing, she's not worthy of love anymore. And then she's like, are you teaching her that? Like, do you discipline her when she- Oh, like, I just want to cry because the church was teaching her that. Yeah. Yeah. And she was just like, and she's also telling me about like, she's afraid of going to hell. And she's like, a child shouldn't worry about that. You know, and she's like, um, she doesn't want to be friends with people at school because she feels like because they don't listen to the um, church, then they're going to go to hell. And she doesn't want to associate with people like that, even though she likes them. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't have friends because she chooses not to be friends with people because they're going to go to hell. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, wow. And like, they could tempt her. Oh, yeah. that is so hard. Can you imagine a little girl going through that? Well, good for you, mommy, for getting her therapy, because yeah. that is the best thing you could have done. That is such a good job. Seeing yes. what the doctrine was being told to you guys, like seeing it played out in your daughter's mm-hmm. life is like it's, it's like a different way to see how unhealthy it is. Yes. We're like, it's happening to you all this mm-hmm. time. But to see like, to see it in that like a uh, really clear vision of like your daughter. Right. Saying those things. And you're like, well, that's not normal. Like a kid yeah. shouldn't feel like that. A kid shouldn't feel like that. And then you're like, wait, like a, a human shouldn't feel like that. Yeah. Nobody yeah. should feel like that. Like, it's just not a good, like healthy way yeah. to think about life and about yes. other people. It- she helped me understand what was going wrong, like what was wrong with me, you know, because I would find myself being in relationships and people having people around that didn't really love me for me, you know, and I felt like I had to do something to keep them in my life. And it's like, no, you deserve to be loved just because everybody deserves that unconditional love, you know. And um, another thing that happened was once we got divorced, he ended up marrying someone in the church. And my daughter knew this person. So at first, you know, when he told her, she was just like, oh, okay. But then when she got off the phone, she would be like, mommy, like, can you believe that? Like, that is so weird. Like, why would he do that? Why would she do that? Why would they agree to that if they knew us? You know, why would they? She's like, that's just like marrying your sister because we were so close. You know, like, that's just so strange that they would get married. And she's like, now I don't even want to go there, but I don't know how to tell him that. He's not going to understand. And I'm like, well, you have to. And every time she would talk to him, she wouldn't be honest. Like, baby, you have to tell him (laughs) how you feel, you know? Like, don't be afraid, you know? Like, there's nothing to be afraid of. And then she's like, I know, but I just don't want to hurt his feelings. And I don't know how to say it. So he felt like I was the reason she was like hesitant and why she, you know, was feeling that way. But when in reality, it was how she felt and she was just afraid of expressing herself. How old was she at that time? That's like recently. That was just last year. The end right. of last year. So she's getting old enough to where she she can know and she's yeah. going to therapy and she's also like living a life now outside of the church. So she's able to see like, wow, there is a different life yes. and there is a different reality. So that's really awesome that you escaped with her and that, she, you know, you exposed her to that. Yes. To the to the real world you know so yeah. so she's able to make her own decisions you know yes and she to it to an extent but yeah, with her like, own free will like you want her to have her free will yes and I always ask own. her like do you feel comfortable with this you know and I ask her like why why not like explain it to me like tell me and I, and I try to tell her try to explain that same thing to your to your dad so he can understand it's not me because like to this day, this week, he basically called me like the poisonous snake. He Aww. called me the serpent. He called me like, you know, the devil. And it's like, how do you expect me to feel comfortable allowing her to be in your presence if you're telling her that I'm the devil? Why, what mother in her right mind would want her child to be around someone who's going to bad mouth her and talk bad about her and say that, you know, if, if, she, if your mom really cared about you, she would um, care about your soul. If she really loved you, you know, like um, she would take you to church and she would do these things. And um, he also say like, you're just buying her with gifts and just, you know, taking her out of the country and you're doing all these things and you're trying to buy her love. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to give her a life. I'm trying to give her, you know, and it's like, I don't know. And I, I really want her to have a relationship with him. My dream was to have a family. 
I was the one who was forcing him to talk to her, forcing him to be with us. And now all of a sudden, I'm the bad guy. I'm like, how am I the bad one? When I was begging, I was crying literally every night, every day. Please, let's spend time together. Look at her. Look how big she is now. And you don't even know her. Let's spend time together. And he would say no. But now all of a sudden, I'm the one that's bad because I'm not allowing her to go there because he calls me Satan. Like, it's so backwards. It's like, I'm the bad guy regardless. And it's like, I'm not. I just want to be a good mother. I want her to understand that she doesn't, she deserves love no matter what. And I am giving her that. And I feel that I am giving her the love that she never had ever before. The love that I was never able to give her before because I was so focused on hell and heaven and, you know, things that had nothing to do with our relationship. And I really feel like now she has a good understanding of what love really means and that she's deserving of love no matter what. And mm-hmm. that's what I stand by. And I am I'm happy and she's happy. And she tells me all the time, like, I'm so glad we chose to leave. I'm so glad this is my life now, like because of you. And like this really like makes me feel so happy because like she'll come in my room and like play with me and just like hug me and like I'm so thankful for you like if it wasn't for you I would still be stuck in the kids room and, you know like things like that and she's like thank you for getting me therapy thank you for having me understand who I am I can finally be myself without feeling guilty for it I can finally you know live my life and be accepted for who I am and that to me is an accomplishment and I love everything about our relationship now like we don't hide anything we're very open with each other she's not afraid to tell me how she feels I give her her voice and she matters everything she says I listen to her and I'm just so happy with who she's becoming now that's amazing you're doing a great job I mean it's so so great to see like the other side of it it's like struggle to get out struggle when you're there but it's like you know, you're coming out on another side and another yeah. part of it. And that's really yeah. cool. It's so exciting yeah. that you and your daughter have this time now to get to know each other. And right. It's like you guys are like learning together, like about yeah. love and, you know, exploring and probably having these really fun adventures that you were never yeah. able to do before, you that's know? Right. Yeah. Yes. And it's amazing. And I feel really bad that she can't have a relationship with her dad, but And I tell her that all the time. And she's like, well, I'm not missing anything. I'm not missing out. Like, you love me enough. Like, the love I get from you is enough for me. And she's like, he doesn't really love me anyway. The only reason why he talks to me is so I can go to the church. It's not even genuine. So don't feel Mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. And she comforts me in that. Because I'm the one that, you know, cries like, oh, my gosh, she doesn't have her father in her life. Like, you know, am I really a bad person? You know, I I always question it. And she's just like, how are you a bad person? Like, Mm. you're here, you're present, Mm. you're aware of who I am and what's going on in my life. That's all you can do for her. You know, you can only do your best. And like, yeah, you know, this is only just a time of the of the journey, you know, and like, he's still just in it. And he's just under that influence, you know, and um, he's not really himself, you know, so Mm -hmm. if you just be patient and just, you know, give him time, you just never know what will happen. Yeah, I, you know, but you can't like wait around for him, you know, but at the same time, just, it's so sad. It is so sad, because it breaks up so many families, but you were doing the right thing. And you're so strong. And your daughter is just so lucky to have you. Great. What do you what do you think? So now you're kind of in the process of healing. Mm-hmm. What do you think has been the most um, beneficial? Because we want to share with all the listeners, you know, what what is helpful to you and your daughter in your healing process? What kind of things have you found to be helpful? What kind of things have you found to maybe not be helpful that you've mm-hmm. tried? So what has not been helpful is trying to figure out something concrete you know, like trying to replace the church uh-huh. with another religion or with another belief, you know, and when when I was going through therapy, what helped me, therapy really helped me a lot. But one thing that the therapist said was, you know, we always wonder and we always worry about life after death, you know, and she's like, but what is the opposite of death? Life, right? So what do you have right now? You have life. So why don't you change the question around and ask, is there life before death? 
Hmm. Because if you spend your whole life wondering what's going to happen after death, then you're not living. Hmm. You're not living your life. So that really helped. That gave me chills. That's a good advice. And yeah. can I just shout I, I out mean to my therapist? <laughs> right. Heck yeah. I wear today. I was walking home from dropping my son off, and there was a hot air balloon above my head, like a uh-huh. flying. Over. And I went, man. I wish I wasn't so afraid of heights because I would love to ride in a hot air balloon. And then I thought, if I was dying of terminal cancer, I would go in a hot air balloon. And then I had this whole like conversation where I was like, that's ridiculous. I'm going to go schedule a hot air balloon ride because I don't want to wait. Come. So I come. Me too. Go. I want to go in a hot I air mean, balloon. I want to yeah. show you. My, um, I, me and Lily, we did a, like the, uh, what is it called when you make a list or you make a collage of things. You oh, want to like a vision board? A vision board. And on my vision board, I have a hot air balloon for this oh, year. Oh, cool. Yes. yes. So I want to do it too. It's we a should. sign. We I should. Terrified. I'm like terrified of heights. And then I'm like, well, yeah. how many people really fall out of a hot air balloon? It doesn't mm. happen. Right I think they catch on fire. I think that's the, I think that's the danger. Okay. <laughs> All right, I need a parachute. Maybe I'll wear a parachute. I'm just yeah. kidding. I put one that's on. awesome. Anyways, I just, that's like the exact thought I was having today where I'm like, why do I do that? Why am I waiting? Well, the continuation of therapy can be that we go to a hot air balloon. Amani, what kind of therapy? Do you mind if I ask? Like, I know there's a lot of different types of therapy and I'm interested. Um, is there a certain type of therapist that you went to or was it just like family therapist or? Um, so I have like three different therapists (laughs) okay because I I didn't know what I wanted like what I needed so I have like a holistic therapist okay um who doesn't really talk about like faith because that just turns turns you off off. me too yeah it Mm -hmm. turns me off I'm just like you know I don't know I don't feel like something's expected of me anymore Mm -hmm. and that's kind of that curing the fact that I need to pay some debt to someone in order to make this life meaningful. That thought had to get erased from my mind. You know, Mm -hmm. I felt like I was born in debt and it's like, okay, now I'm here. I didn't ask to be here, but now I owe someone something so I can feel comfortable with being, you know, given this life. That's kind of where the trauma started, which was even before the church. So the church just kind of built that trauma up, (laughs) you know, it made it bigger. But um, getting rid of that kind of helped me. And that was through the holistic therapist, you know, like through yoga, meditation, um, dancing, um, just understanding my intentions and understanding that I have control over my life. And I don't need uh, instructions to do the right thing, you know, like. Because like I, t- I have this argument with people all the time, not really an argument, but like a debate. Um, and they're like, "Yeah, but don't you feel like you're, you know, you need God to help you, you know, be a better person?" And I'm like, "But why am I a bad person? Like, I don't want to kill anyone. I don't want to like, I don't kill anything. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm not a bad person. Like, why do I need someone to justify who I am?" Like, where does that idea even come from? Right. And through therapy, I was able to realize that because she would ask me, you know, like, what do you feel like you need to do? You know, and I'm like, I just want to do the right thing. And she's like, OK, so what's stopping you from doing the right thing? And I'm like, oh, I'm like the devil. And she's like, OK, so how does the devil have control over you? Why are you allowing the devil to control you? And I'm like, what do you mean allowing? And she's like, yeah, whatever happens to you is what you allow to happen to you. Mm. She's like, even she's like, if the, if the devil exists or if he doesn't, regardless, whatever you do, you allow it to happen. Nobody can turn off your brain and get into your body and possess you and make you do something you don't want to do. Everything you do is because it's intentional. But that's what they make you think, huh? They make you think like Satan can just like come into your body and take you over. Yeah, that's what they make you think. Like you have no control over who you are. Like God Mm -hmm. made you an empty vessel. And at any moment you can be possessed by anything and you won't have control Mm -hmm. over who you are anymore. And it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so I'm nobody. That's Mm -hmm. basically what they make you think. But then Mm -hmm. through therapy, it's like, no, you are a person. You have a conscience. You have a say-so with what happens to you. If you 
commit a crime, it's because that's something that you wanted to do, not because someone forced you to or someone turned off your brain and took over your body and made you do it. No, right. that's people who think that way are people who don't want to take responsibility of who they are or their actions. Right. And she's like, you need to take responsibility of who you are. If you're a good person, then be a good person. Stop right. blaming it on God. Stop blaming it on the sa- on Satan. Right. And like, that's how she would talk to me. And I'm just like, mm. oh, my God. That gave me so much power. Like, you're right. I want to be a good person because that's who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, and the reason why I felt uncomfortable when I was told, when I was told not to um, preach to certain people, that's why I felt guilty because of my conscience. Yeah. Because it's like, wait a second, but aren't we trying to save everyone? You know, and I was looked at like, oh, you have weak faith and you don't understand the will of God. And, you know, like, oh, you're so self-righteous. And it's like, no, I have a heart and I'm using it. And um, I thank myself for that. I, I think if anything, um, like norm, religion usually is like conflicting with morality. Yes. Like, there's a lot of stuff in religion. Um, like I think like naturally as humans, the judgment. Yeah. Comes, to other people is like based on because God in this writing says mm-hmm. that this or whatever. And it's silly because I think innately we're just like, I don't care if gay people get married, you know, like, yeah, stuff doesn't matter to me as a person. But if you add religion and you're like, I don't care, but God cares. Yeah. If God cares about it. I have to care about it. Right. That kind of stuff. And that's exactly. like, exactly like morality of just like, I want everybody to be happy and I could. Yeah. Care. Speaking of that topic, I was talking to my dad about that the other day and um, he was like, it's so funny how we feel like someone who's born a woman can't be a man, you know, yeah. like, oh, they can't make that decision. You know, like, oh, I, you know, I feel like I'm a, you know, I feel like I'm a, a woman or I feel like I'm a man and you know they change their gender and we look at them like oh my god how dare you what do you mean like you can't change God's God intended for you to be this and you have to be that right you know like God didn't make any mistakes with your gender however they teach in the church like oh you have to be Jew you have to be this and if you're from this race you're not God's chosen people oh so God made a mistake with making the races but he didn't make a mistake with making genders yeah. You know, like, mm-hmm. I have to be born a Jew in order to have salvation or I have to be, you know, That's a, a good point. Thing. Like you can't control your, um, yeah. your um, you can't and control like your, your race, race, just like you can't control your gender. Exactly. Like, like you have so no you control over it. At just the same. Like God didn't right. make a mistake when God made me a black woman. Like I was born this way for a reason. So you telling me like, oh, we can't preach to that type of people because of this reason so you're saying god made a mistake when he made haitians is that what you're saying so they're not worthy of salvation god made them less of a person because of the color of their skin right or because they're gay or because yeah it really opened up my mind and i'm just so thankful that i am in this place that i'm in right now it's really you can say you can stop yourself and say uh, like, what? How do I actually feel about this? Yes, I am. I am in there now, and I am. I, I am. Yes. I, I have the ability to make those decisions for my own self now. Right, because You're it's just better. Your world views and not an indoctrination of something that they told you. Exactly. Like I okay. feel better doing the right thing because it's my decision, other than being told or you know being afraid of not doing something because right. it's continuing it's not it's a not on your own free will you're doing it because you want to not because somebody's yes. forcing you or because it's going to be put on a video to be blasted right. out to the whole world exactly and then it's like oh but there are some murderers who came to god and became good people but why did they become a good person though you know like was it all because of god or are they afraid of something they feel like they have to at the end of this life, they have to be, you know, accountable. So then right. they change. Why right. do we need someone outside of ourselves to get us to make that decision? Right. We should just be good on our own. Yeah. We should just be good people without getting a reward. Right. I don't care yeah, if I afraid. get a crown or a, I want to be a good person because I want to be treated like a good person. Right. Not because I'm going to get a reward for it. You know, right. I don't want to do the right thing because I'm afraid of burning. No, I right. want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Right, for sure. And be sincere about it. Yeah. So 
you had um is holistic is holistic therapy your recommendation is that and that's what helped you is that the best therapy that you would recommend yes did you ever see a cult therapist or a cult specialist i'm just curious because mm -hmm. um they're kind of difficult to find and sometimes mm -hmm. they're a little expensive and i'm just curious you know how um, many people go to cult therapy i did not like you said they're expensive and they're really mm -hmm. hard to find mm -hmm. but I want to become a cult therapist, actually. Oh, that's right. Cool. I heard that survivors of cults make the best therapists. Cult yeah. Therapists, yeah. I, I'm actually looking into trying to get some type of something. Like, I want to become a holistic therapist because right. I know what it feels like to be on the other side. And right. I, not many people know that. Yeah. Like, how to transition from feeling like you are incompetent to live your life that you were given from God or from the creator, you know, cause that's what I say now, creator. We were created by someone. I don't know who, but mm -hmm. we were. So I just feel like I have that ability to help and I really want to start, you know, like, so if anybody, you can email me. I feel like I can, you know, give some advice. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. We'll put your email in the show notes for everybody. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll put that in. And um, also, Amani, it seems like through your healing, you've been really creative and um, you're working on a magazine, a, a virtual, a digital magazine. Yes. And also your song that you that we allowed us to play is really beautiful. Yes, it really helped me too. like when I found myself kind of like just doubting because I would still go through that transition like, man, are they right? Am I wrong? You know, like, did you go through that? juggle for a long time i still I go that through that i wonder if we'll have that our whole life i don't know yeah i don't know i hope but not i kept thinking like you know why did i leave in the first place you know like i kept talking to myself like you know was it really satan or was it the mistreatment or was it the judgment or was it the neglect or was it the, you know, right. the discrimination? This whole list of things. Relationship. <laughs> you yeah. know, to do an amazing. abusive relationship, you have to go, yeah. like, make a list. Like, that person yes. and like, no, why did I leave? I got to go back and do all the yes. things. Why I left. Remind exactly. yourself over and over. Yes. Yeah. Like, no, it was the neglect. It was the abuse. It was all of these things. And if anything, though, that list of why I left resembles Satan more than anything else. Yeah. So that comforts me knowing that those aren't from God, you know, that mental abuse and telling people they're not good enough and making them feel like crap is not from God. You know, like it's not. God wants us to have power and power comes from love. The only way we can actually go out and help other people is by loving them, not by judging them, not by making them feel like they're less than. And the church feeds off of ego. They feed off of that ego. Whoever's more egotistical, like, oh, yeah, they can be a leader or, you know, like or who has the most fear. Oh, yeah, they can be a leader. You know, it's like it's not about, oh, wow, look how amazing she loves people. Look how giving and look how amazing she those people don't ever get chosen <laughs> to be a leader because it's like you're not giving your love to the church. You're giving yeah. it to people. And that's not the point. We want right. you to to be give obedient us, give obedient. us yeah to be a robot mm -hmm. Take, yep. you know be right. an empty vessel for them to enter and control you that's it right they want you to be an empty vessel they tell you that mm -hmm. yeah and that's not what we we're, we were created to be right. we're full we're not incomplete there and you were void. Right. You are a creative person. You are very creative. I mean, you can just tell like you have style. That's why in El Salvador, it must have been very frustrating because you were like, yes. I want to be colorful. I want to yes. be creative. I want to express myself. Exactly. And they were like, no, yes. <laughs> put on your nylons and you be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're not wearing stockings. Go home yeah. and get some. Like go to right. CVS and grab some stockings. Oh, yeah. That was not allowed to have bare legs. Yeah, it was yeah. bad. And like even uh, my daughter, like when I chose her school here, she's like, please do not have us wear uniform. Whatever you do, I don't care what rating the school is in, but I need to express myself through my clothing. Like she loves fashion. So I love that. That's fashion. really beautiful. See, you guys are, 
you must be having such a great time now coming out and exploring and, you know, doing different things with your fashion. See, I don't like, like, I'm not good at fashion. I'm like, I can wear a t-shirt and jeans. And so coming out was really difficult as far as what to wear, because I would be like, I don't really know what to wear. I don't know what the styles are. Like, I know how to wear like my like bank, bank, banker suit. That's what I know how to wear. But like, I don't know. So even nowadays, I'm just like, if I could just have like, you know, one week's worth of clothes and just like rotate it, I would be yeah. fine because I don't know what to wear. Wow. So I think that's something interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. No, yeah, I, but I'm so excited to see like all the creative things that you're going to do, you know, with your music and with your magazine. Yes, me yeah, too. We'll definitely send a link to the magazine when it's up and ready. Yes, yeah. it should be ready. I'm going to visit family this weekend. So Fun. I'm excited hey. that. Um, but it will be ready soon. I'll let I'll email you and let you know. No for pressure. Sure. No pressure. Okay. We'll do we'll tell. We'll I just have one more quick random question. Totally mm -hmm. random. Is your family still Jehovah Witness? No. My no. great grandmother is, but not really. They they'll say it, you know, like they'll mm -hmm. say things like, Oh, Jehovah, they'll call God Jehovah, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their actions and their who they are, no, they're not. Usually Jehovah Witness, uh, from what I've seen, I don't know if it's really true, but mm -hmm. just seems like Jehovah Witness families tend to stay and Je like it's they don't really come out either. Like it's hard to escape mm -hmm. that. I mean, that but it's type not as of demanding thinking. either. Right, right. It's not as demanding? No. Oh. Not I mean, I've never experienced too much demand and from them but I was never we weren't really that deep into it anyway right you know? maybe as the generations went on it just sort of like filtered yeah, yeah. out a little bit yeah do you um do you and your daughter celebrate like Christmas and Halloween and all that now no no you still don't because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I could witness is you you probably wouldn't have then either right no I yeah I never really did I think I probably did like once or twice my whole life. Yeah. Um, and child. So my like gender, that wasn't surprising when you came into the church. Like yeah, no. Yeah. I never had a thing for holidays anyway. Yeah. I was more so about birthdays, but Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate birthdays either. Yeah. Right. So now like me and my daughter, we do this thing like for the first half not half, like every day up until the day of our birthday, we'll do like a um like either We'll go somewhere or we'll celebrate our birthday every day up until the actual day. That's cool. So that's like our holiday for the year. That's pretty yeah. much all we do. Um, yeah. But we have fun every week. Every week we have something yeah. on the schedule to do. Yeah. Like, that is so cool. You guys just get to go and have adventures and and explore. And I, I feel like you just have such a more of an appreciation for that time together because yeah. you realize like how precious it was and you realize how easily your mind can be manipulated mm -hmm. and your own freedom can be taken away from you like that. Yeah. So I just feel like you just, you know, cherish you all cherish the amazing so things. Yeah. yeah. Even her teachers, they'll, they'll like come to me like, wow, your daughter is so amazing. I can tell you love her. I can tell she loves you. Like, Every chance she gets, she talks about you. Oh, my mom, my mom, my oh, mom. Oh, that's sweet. And I'm just oh, enjoy kidding. that because she'll be a teenager soon. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, she'll be a teenager this year, actually. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but they, like, I get so much compliments on my relationship with her. Like, so that's many, awesome. like, even my best friend, like, if I ever have a child, I really want to have a relationship like you and your daughter. Like, oh, you guys so are sweet. so amazing. Like, There's we'll stop in the street. Cool. There's something special about having um, a kid young. Yeah. Because you are like growing up together. Like I feel Absolutely. like with my daughter, we were like figuring shit out together. Yeah. yeah. And so I have a son now and he's young. You know, I had him later. Mm -hmm. And you feel like you're more like set in your ways, I guess, when you're older and you have a kid. Yeah. But when you have, when you have a kid young, it's like it, there's an element of it where it's obviously harder because you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Right. But there's flexible. an element of it that's like so free, like cool because you're doing it together and you're just like, I don't know what we're doing, but follow along. Child. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, so. but like I'll tell her like, you know, I'm so sorry that I'm not, you know, like sometimes I don't know what to do. 
you know, and she's just like, it's okay. We're all imperfect. I don't expect you to know what to do. You mm. know, like we're fi- we'll figure it out together. You know, like don't worry she about. That's so it. sweet. Can she come on the hot air balloon with us? Yes, <laughs> she would. Okay, cool. She would do it. Yes, I want you guys to meet her so sure. much. Like she For is sure. so amazing. And um, another thing I wanted to mention. I know this is probably really long, but. No. <laughs> um, this week, one, you know, the deaconess I said she was close to, mm-hmm. um, she, the deaconess, texted my daughter's phone and it was like, you know, oh, I, I miss you. I can't wait to see you. And this deaconess is now in Denver. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. At so, the Denver um, church? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yep. They're, I think they're the leaders there, actually. Mm. She reached out to my daughter and was just kind of like, oh, I really want to see you because before like last year around like august um my ex-husband and my daughter were planning to go visit them because they were really close <clears throat> so one time that he called he mentioned how the deaconess from denver came to florida to the wedding that he um, just had um, you know so it, and then when my daughter found out she was like i cannot believe that she supported that like i never would have expected her to do that you know, like, how how can you say you love me, but yet you're supporting my dad in a relationship that is not okay? You know, like, so that's not love, you know, like, and when she said that, I'm like, you know, you're so right. So I text her from my phone, like, I, you know, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't reach out to my daughter anymore. Like, I know you know what's going on, you know, because I know, I knew she went to the wedding. And during that time, this was all happening with my daughter you know the whole therapy thing and her lying back and forth so i'm i know he told them and he even said that he talks to them all the time but she responded and it's like oh no i don't know what you're talking about i just wish your family the best and i'm like oh yeah really well i know you went to his wedding so yeah you're lying to me and she didn't respond and it's just like just and then she's like just let just let her know um that i uh, really loved her and that i wish her the best and that um I don't know. It just felt so fake. And it's just like, why are you still reaching out to my It's so yucky. It's like, don't contact her and say that stuff. Like, it doesn't feel good because I'm sure your daughter loves her, too. Yeah. Or not, too, but, like, I'm sure your daughter feels a connection with her because she grew up with her. So it's, like, confusing for her. And she's she's trying to heal and have therapy. And it's like, stop confusing her. Yeah. If you exactly. love her, then love her and just, you know, love her and just support her. And she's not in the church anymore. Yeah. But don't, like, confuse her and be like, I miss you. You need to come yeah. to church. You know, it's so exactly. manipulative. I'm so sorry you guys are dealing with But luckily, like, the way my daughter thinks now, she knows. It's very, like, she's very aware now. She's like, wow, that's so weird how I thought that that was okay you know like Mm. and she would even say like I would she would feel so uncomfortable in the kids room but when she would come out like at the end of the day they would be like oh wow you're such a good gospel worker you're such you're going to be such a good gospel worker when you grow up because you don't you don't give mommy a hard time when you're in the kids room alone by yourself so in her mind she's like oh so this feeling that I have of not wanting to be in here is bad because I'm being praised for doing it so that right there is what she, what my daughter told me was kind of confusing to her. Like, why am I getting praised and complimented on things I don't like to do? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? And that was. Every of- day, over and over and over. And then it just becomes a repetitive, you know, um, like self talk in her mind. And yeah, then that, that she has kind of, to. Right. And that it's- a good thing you know so she started she's like I started to think that that was the way I was supposed to be and that something was wrong with me for thinking that there was something wrong with it right and now she's like and I'm so glad it's been cleared up that that whole time that feeling that I felt was real that she's like that was the real me feeling uncomfortable right so, trying to get out yeah so man it's so it reminds me of multiple personality disorder like I literally feel like I have two people inside of me I have like my real me and then I have like the cult me and like it just feels like you could just switch it it on and off but it's like how can you just still be one person and have two totally different people yeah wow it's very interesting good way of putting it 
And your daughter's still so young and kids are so resilient and she's she's going to be a strong, strong young woman. So I'm yeah. excited for her. Me too. Me too. Amani, thank you for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to see you guys again. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Lindsay, do you have any more questions or anything you want to ask her? Um, not that I can think of, but yeah, just keep us updated on everything. Like if you write I some know. more music, we would love to play yes. it. Um, Another song coming up. Yay. Or YouTube channels or YouTube videos or whatever. Yes. Anything you want to share on here, we would definitely love to like stay in contact with you. And Yeah, for sure. Uh, if anything happens or we want to do like an update later. Yes. Back on absolutely. another time. Yes, yes, yes. I will definitely keep you updated. Yeah, stay in touch cool. with us. Yes, and I will be listening to every podcast you upload. I love them. My sister actually went to the church too, and I just sent her the podcast. And she's like, oh, my God, why are you just now telling me about this? She's like, I want to be on there, too. I want to meet them. I want to go. Oh, how cute. Like, was she baptized in the church? Yeah. Or really? She was she was in Atlanta? Three for three yep. years? Mm -hmm. Damn. I could never get Lindsay to go. I tried. I tried every day of my life to get her to go. Yeah. And she was so stubborn. No, yeah, <laughs> I would go. I would go. No, you would go. But, I mean, you would I never would get baptized. Be, I'd be like, I don't even believe in the Bible, you after a while, I just didn't want to bring her anymore because I'm like, God, all she does is argue and I need to go study. She's wasting my precious time. Oh, honey, this is not, this is kind of off topic, but I, I had this memory of um, when you were the leader of that house church. Yeah. And we went and um, one of the guys there was just OK. So like we drive like three hours to go see Tony and I, we're already I had my daughter with me and she was little, like four or five. So it was kind of like a three hour car ride with a top, you know, a little kid. So we get there kind of like annoyed that we had to go do that, you know. And then this guy was there and I didn't really have any interest in like talking about the Bible. I wanted to just like visit my sister and check on her. And he kept going on and on about like, well, you know, don't I feel sad for you that you don't believe in this because, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in this and all this stuff. And. Uh, I got I you wanted to punch him <laughs> so mad at him because he was like, well, what do you think happens to your soul when you die? And I was like, I think we just get eaten by maggots. Shut up. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> and Tony was like, OK, like separate. Like she was so <laughs> uncomfortable because I'm like getting pissed off with this guy. Yeah. And I it was, was so like, awkward when my charlatan <laughs> sister would come and yeah. cause a ruckus. And I'd be like, Lindsay, shut up. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> well, he was just like, he wouldn't leave me alone. And I kept trying to, like, get away from him because I was like, dude, I don't want to talk to you. Like, I came to visit my sister. Yeah. But it's so sad that you, the, the way you see your family changes so drastically. Yes. Like, you're almost okay thinking that your family's going to hell. Like, oh, well, they're not listening. Like, they're just a burden to me. And, yeah. like, I cannot believe I ever thought that. And I did. I know. I am so sorry. I, I thought so that, sorry. too. Like, no. I know. It makes you feel so bad. You're like, oh, my God. I feel so bad. Because yeah. even though they came to visit me, three hours they drove to come to visit me, I was like, you guys, I got preaching to do. What are we doing? What are we doing? Let's have lunch. You guys yeah. got to get out of here. I got stuff to do. We are like trying to have lunch. And that guy was trying to talk at me while I was trying to like spend time with you. Because I'm under all this pressure. I'm like, I'm yeah. the church leader. I got to, I still got to take care of the members. I still have appointments. I still have baptisms going on. It's still, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I don't have time for you guys to be here. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's how you're thinking. And it's just I like so, so fucked so up. Because I, I hadn't seen them for years. months. I know. I'm so sorry. That's why, girl, I had to do a whole episode of apologies. I could do 25 episodes of apologies mm -hmm. because you just feel so bad. Well, let me say this, though. You guys are not the only church that teaches that if you don't believe in it, you're going to hell. So don't feel, like, horribly guilty. I have so many people. Not that just that. Just, like, the way you yeah, feel towards your family when that. you're in there. Yeah. 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 That's true. It's, but, like, you know, weird. that's a pretty common concept that, like, Christians or um, I don't really know about like I'm sure Muslims don't. I don't know it doesn't feel the same <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's oh, reasoning it. behind it you know mm -hmm. other churches say like yeah your family members if they don't join it's because they're you know they're going to go to hell but this church they tell you the reason they're going to hell is because they try to kill God because they're murderers because they're evil people because underneath that skin is a gremlin evil devil trying to <laughs> eat your soul 
that's how you see your family. Literally. Remember, levels. Lindsay, when we, when me and my sister lived together, and I would feel like literally I would feel dirty from being around her, and I would tell her I have to go to third day to be cleansed so that my so that I can get all this dead body off of me because I was yeah. spending time with her, and I swear to God I believed it. Me too. I swear to God I believed that she was me. a dead body. And it was like literally being around my friends and family life. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Yes. That's why we apologize, Lindsay, because you don't know our thoughts. You don't know how gross our thoughts were. (laughs) Dang. Well, all right. Never mind. I take it all back. (laughs) (laughs) All right, girls. Let's go on a hot air balloon ride, okay? Let's do it. Let's freaking do it. Okay, fine. parachute though because in case it burns and you guys i'll just hold on to you guys okay if it lights on fire i don't really want to die so um right if yeah. that's a fire if that's a hazard that might happen <sighs> this is the whole point of it Lindsay. we're just it, supposed to go we're just yeah. supposed to go we can't or worry I'll kill two birds of one stone because no I- parachute no nothing we're just going no nope. <laughs> That's the yes. whole point of conquering your fears is you do it. Yes, uh, you do it scared. Do if it we scared. can escape a cult, you can hot ride in a hot air balloon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I have no, like, no fear, like, of doing anything. Right. I think my fear has really gotten so, like, less because it's, I like. I have a lot of social anxiety. I'm so, like, awkward as hell. I'm so, yeah. still a little bit awkward. But, you know, it's getting better. It is getting better through the podcast. But I just embrace it. You know, like, yeah. I don't know. I, I think I heard one of the podcasts, I think it was Chad, when he was just like, you know, I, I was in a cult, so excuse my behavior. Excuse uh-huh. me, you know. Uh-huh. I do that, too. I try to, like, explain a little bit about myself. Like, if I seem weird, you know, it's because two years ago I would have thought you're a gremlin underneath your skin. Sorry. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm the opposite. I can't. And that's why I think I had to do the podcast so that I could say it once. And for all, so everybody could hear it at one time, and I don't have to individually tell people. Yeah, Tony, you know, because I can't telling. People. I can't talk to anybody about it, mm-hmm. which is so weird. And now I'm telling the whole world. <laughs> yeah, but you feel yeah. like I mean, you do a little bit more because of this, but I feel like you really yeah. don't like address it with people directly. No, I don't. I don't want you to. You never have. That's why. I, that's why I was like, you need to talk about it. So but why they don't, don't understand. broadcast it to mm-hmm. the whole world? Yeah. I'm afraid of their reaction. I, I honestly yeah. swear to God, I'm afraid to look somebody in the eye and say that I was in a cult. I don't know how to do that. I don't. Yeah. And you right. don't owe it to anybody. You do it uh, however you need to. But I want them to know, like, deep down, I want to tell them. I yeah. want to. But I don't know how. Like, I'm so scared they're going to be like, oh, my God, you're crazy. What is wrong with you? <laughs> you know? I haven't gotten that response. Like, yeah, I, right. I've been made fun of, but it was like funny, you know, like right, my friends right. just kind of made jokes about it. Like, right. I, I'm oh, sure nobody would be mean about it. Yeah. Yeah. There, Cause my friend, I went to um their house last night and I, and I was talking to them about it. Cause I told him about the podcast and he was just like, Oh wait, I think I'm getting a sign from the Korean God. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> right. Like, I, Can you like, imagine though if he would have said that joke when you were in the church and how offended you would have yeah. been? Mm-hmm. You would have been yeah. like, "Oh my God, you're the devil! I can't associate with you anymore." It's so interesting how like the same situation, and you could have two totally different, you know, reactions. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, and he's like, "I want to go there." He's like, "There's one in Charlotte." He's like, "I gotta go." He's like, "When I go, I'm gonna wear a white robe. Oh, and I'm dude. gonna walk in." But I'm just like, he's just so funny. That's like, funny. I like- you know, sometimes people think that, that they want to try to go into a cult. But you know what I would say? Don't do it. Because what if they get you? I told him that. And he's just you like, know, what if they get, not like, don't, get me. don't ever go in there and think they will not get you because they will get you. <laughs> yeah, but they, because he feels like how, he's like, there's no way in the world you can convince me that a woman in Korea is God. And I'm like, there is a way. Trust me. Yeah. He's just like, no. Trust like me. There's billions. not. Do you think there's billions of people or millions that, that follow this religion? Um, According I, to them, there's millions. According yeah, I to don't them. Think that number is real, um, but I don't know. I don't think the concept is really that far fetched off of like basic Christianity. I mean, there's like the added things, right? And it's obviously more intense. But I don't think it's like a, I think if you are able to believe in the basic teachings of Christianity. The Bible. 
mm-hmm. Bible. Then you add in a few more like interesting plot points, and then yeah. There you go. And then it's yeah. the behavioral control that's like change, you know, that's what makes yes. it difficult. It's the control, the control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, oh yeah, one thing I really, really wanted to mention, I I almost forgot. But so there was a sister who recently called me, and um, I'm not gonna say her name. However, she was asking me. She's like, do you? She still goes there, and she's like, do you think they um, create the sermons based off of going to like people's houses and like reporting like do you she's like she's like when you were a leader did they do that or how did they and i'm just like yes like and she's like so i remember that one time you were preaching to me about having you know because how she didn't want her kids in the kids room and um they told me to study with her because i was the one who was comfortable with neglecting my child in the kids room so they had me to, you know study with her so um and she's like do you think, oh, let me not say it because I don't want to, mm, it's going to. I know what you, I know what you're saying though. Like they would take them yeah. from the members' lives. Like, yes. so the leaders will report to the pastor what's happening in everybody's life. Mm-hmm. And so then the pastor will like, will like create the sermon around yes. some certain situation to address it. And it's like, you know that he's addressing that situation, uh-huh. but he's yeah. not exactly saying it, but like it pops up in the sermons or it'll pop up in your study or like she says they'll use a certain member for a certain reason you know to show like oh look at this member you know exactly and um she was saying she's like but that's not right because um they're basically making you think god knows everything when really it's just gossip they're gossiping about my per my problems and you're making me think, oh, God can read my mind and God knows what's going on. You know, that's why they ask us to tell on them. If they come in in confidence and tell us a secret, they encourage us to tell. That way they can make a sermon on it so they can think, right. oh, wow, I told right. this person that I trust. And they, um, you know, nobody else knows. So God has to be real. This this you, has to be the truth. You literally feel like God is speaking Talking. to you. Yeah, but actually, it's because, you know, everybody just really you. knew about it. But you guys, I think that's called mystical manipulation. I could be wrong, but I was just listening about it. Steve Hassan made a podcast, Imani. He made his own podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm going to post it. And he was talking about it, about mystical manipulation and how, like, they make you think God is doing something. But really, mm-hmm. they're manipulating it behind the scenes. And so, yes. God, that is so messed up. It messed up. It's super creepy. Yeah. Mm. Another another term I learned was direct reaction propaganda. Ooh, what's that? Which is when they when they'll say like certain things are not uh, acceptable, but then when people leave and complain about it, they'll alter the rules so that what people are saying bad doesn't reflect the image of the church. Why, weren't you saying that you saw pictures of people going on vacation? Exactly. So like if if somebody were to come out of the church and be like, I, you know, I always got in trouble for wanting to go on vacation. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. So then they'll say, like, you know what? Mother feels so sorry that her children yep. are, you know, go, leaving and complaining yep. about this world. And, you know, we're so sinful. And, you know, how we have that sinful nature to want to enjoy our lives, even though we don't deserve it. So mother's going to give us a pass this weekend. Right. And she's going to allow us to go out and go on vacation. Look how merciful. Right. How so then you're like, oh, thanks to mother for allowing me to go on vacation yeah. but yeah like you said but then they change it kind of like thanksgiving yes like how they said thanksgiving was pagan and forbidden and mm-hmm. then later they're like oh they're blaming us because it's not like maybe it. not really oh, pagan. Shit. the americans are real serious about this fucking thanksgiving thing maybe we should <laughs> yeah. just maybe we should just let them celebrate <laughs> it <laughs> like they probably got so much like heat for that i bet there were yeah. a lot of members that were just like wait that doesn't make Pretty sense. soon they'll be preaching to homeless people you guys yes exactly <laughs> they're gonna start preaching to homeless people Black, more black people, they're going to just start, you know, going against their own word. Because so many Haitians, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. And that is called direct reactional. I think it's reactional propaganda. That is so, so interesting. That's, that's a really fascinating. Big, that's like yeah. a big thing that they do. Mm-hmm. I like the whole Thanksgiving thing was when I was just like, this shit is stupid. Yeah. Because <laughs> you can celebrate it for so long. And like seeing her go 
we can't celebrate it because it's tied to like um, the Christians coming over, right? Like it's a religious holiday, really. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I was like, no, it's not. It's so stupid, right? And like I'm arguing, arguing. And then one year she's just like, oh, well, they never told us. It was a misunderstanding. And I was like, I know. You clearly it. said. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know, like but it. you convince yourself. Like, like you literally convince yourself. Like, oh, I just misunderstood. Right. Yeah. Eh, who cares? I, Move I, on. Yeah, I went back to my notes, to my weeds and wheat notes. And like, yeah. you put the weeds, and then you put the wheat underneath the little thing. That's I had study. Thanksgiving under weeds. Yes, like, for I sure. From a pastor. So don't tell me you did not say Thanksgiving for sure. Pagan feast because you for did. For sure. For sure. For yeah. yeah. I bet that that's what happened though. That like too many Amer like in America, people were like, I have to celebrate Thanksgiving. It's yeah. interesting that that word was propaganda. That yeah. propaganda was in that in that um, official yep. title of it. You know. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So I interesting. That oh, that would be an yeah. interesting episode just to do. All about propaganda. About yes. How propaganda is more than we imagine. I think we I think we see propaganda in our everyday life, whether you're in a cult or not, you know. And we're so unaware of it. That's a good idea. I'm gonna write it down in my little notebook. Yes. Like blues clues in my notebook. <laughs> right. <laughs> my handy dandy notebook. Yeah. <laughs> If you think of any other like experiences that you've had there that kind of fall into that, let us know. We'll add it. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah. start. Just, I talked to some right. of the members that left too, and they helped me. You know, like give me other reasons. Oh, remember this? Oh, remember that? Remember this? Right. Happened? So, yeah, I do yeah. think that connecting with other members is really helpful. Like, oh yeah. gosh, I've made yeah so many good friends, and you yes. too. Well, yeah. let us know, too, that anybody who feels, like, ready to talk about it, just to mm-hmm. send us an email, I mean. Yeah, yeah. they're scared right now still. Yeah. yeah, everybody has different, different, different yeah. problems. Yeah. Not everybody needs to speak out. Not everybody needs to speak out. I just feel like I, I need to just speak out, yeah. And yeah. I love All right. it. I have so much fun, like, meeting you guys and yeah. hearing all of these different stories that are all the same. Yeah. yeah. Like, you guys are... All right, Amani, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you guys again for creating this amazing podcast and being so open and inviting. And I love it. Everything about it. I love everything. And your song is hilarious. I learned thank the words you. to it. And my do- and my, uh, my sister's like, that song is so creative. She's like, don't do us. That's oh all God. Lindsay. That is all Lindsay. She's yes. the creative side of it all. Thank you guys. Well, well, what's funny is I was I I made it like a quieter song, and Tony's like, no, it needs to be like a rock song, like a metal song. <laughs> she made like a serious song, like that made me want to cry. And I was like, Tony, it's a ukulele. How am I supposed to rock out on a ukulele? <laughs> and then I was just like, as a joke, I did that. And then Tony's like, exactly like that. And I was like, okay. Oh, it's <laughs> I was perfect. just joking, but. <laughs> you should play the original one time for everybody. That would be so funny. Oh, yeah. I have to go back and find it. That's a good yeah. idea. If I yeah. find it, I'll add it to the end of this episode. Yes. That would be funny. If I can't find it, I'll just, it's just lost forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that all right, great. girls. All right. Thank all right. you so much. We'll see you soon. We'll be in touch yes. with you. See you soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Bye. Let's Bye. do the ending. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's do the ending. Sorry. Premature ending. Sure. Right. Okay. You can, you take it, girl. Wait. How, wait. What is it? Boom. Yeah, boom. Baby. Okay. Is there a hand to it? A hand? There's a hand. You can do a hand. You can do okay. whatever you want. <laughs> All right. So, boom, baby. Boom, baby. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.